Oh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Um, on behalf of NRM Regions Australia, I'd like to welcome you all to another In the Tent with NRM. Um, this is our webinar series that features speakers requested by the NRM Regions or um, some of our partners as well. Um, my name is Richard Ingram and I'll be your host today with uh, lots of support from my colleagues um, Trish and Saj who are out there. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the country throughout Australia where we live and work. In my case, it's Lutruwita, Tasmania. Um, we acknowledge the role of First Nations science and stewardship of healthy country and the deep and enduring connection to lands, waters and communities. We pay respect to First Nations cultures and to elders past and present and commit to working together to care for our country. Um, we're delighted to welcome our guest presenters today. Um, we've got Ashley Harkin, Andrew McLean and Stephanie Dixon from the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, and they're going to give us a presentation today and provide some insight into the My Climate tool. Um, we'll also be available for Q&A at the end. Um, today's webinar will be recorded and it'll be available shortly through our NRM Regions Australia YouTube playlist, um, along with other editions of In the Tent if you've missed any. Um, you'll also receive a follow-up email with links that include a short feedback survey, which I would really like to encourage you to fill in. It takes literally not even a minute if you're really rushing through it, um, but it will definitely help us to help you and get some good guest presenters on and cover the topics that you're really interested in. Um, there will also be a, a chance to link to um, our Slack channel where you can continue the conversation, ask questions of our guests over the next couple of weeks. So I think that's about enough from me. Um, I'd like to hand over to Ashley, who's going to take us through the presentation. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Richard. Hi, everyone. And thanks for letting me hijack all of your lunch times and for taking an interest in my climate view. I'm just going to share my screen. So for those who I haven't met before, my name is Ash Harkin. I've been with the Bureau of Meteorology for nearly three years now. Um, I've been working in the customer engagement team for the Climate Services for Agriculture program. And I must also note, although I work for the Bureau, I'm not a meteorologist or a climatologist. Um, so I'll do my best with any of your more technical questions. Um, but my background's actually been in horticultural agronomy, um, where I worked for quite a few years over in the Hawkesby region, which is over in Northwest Sydney. So in the very early stages of this program, we set out to understand how we can better enable farmers and land managers to make more informed and proactive climate decisions so that they're better prepared and able to adapt to future climate challenges and be more cli climate resilient into the long future. Uh, and to do this, we carried out a series of engagements to better understand what climate challenges were being faced across a range of commodities and a range of regions across all of Australia. And with these insights and feedback we collected, we disseminated that within our project team, um, including to our developers and user experience designers, um, as well as ag and climate scientists to really help to inform the development of my climate view. And this helped us to really ensure that there would be high value and ease of use for those who will be using the tool. So today it would be really great to understand the ways that you see it could be of value in your roles and I'd be happy to follow up with any of you if you had any feedback around how we could improve the tool as well to make it more fit for purpose for you. Uh, and just to give a bit of a sense of what we're going to cover off from today, so we'll start with a bit of a backgrounder on weather and climate information including a bit more detail around the data we have integrated into My Climate View. We'll then dive into a live demonstration of My Climate View and its functionality. Um, and if we have some time at the end, I'll also brief briefly introduce the prototype product um, that we've been developing called Map View, which I note is not currently pu publicly available, um, but a product that I think would be relevant and valuable to this audience in particular. Um, and then we'll allocate some time for questions at the end. All right, so starting with weather and climate. So we'll start with some definitions and many of these may seem you know, pretty self-explanatory, but we often hear the terminology around weather and climate, for example, used interchangeably. 
So just to make sure we're all on the same page when we're talking about each of these concepts. And when we're talking about weather, we're talking about the state of atmosphere at a particular place and time. A forecast is an analysis of the state of the weather in an area with an assessment of likely developments. The seasonal outlook is given either as probabilities or a chance of exceeding a certain threshold. Um, and that's usually presented anything from one week to one to three months out. Um, and an example of that is the Bureau's long range forecast. And uh, when we're talking about climate, we're talking about um, a description of the long term pattern of weather in a particular area. And that can be defined as the average weather for a particular region and time period. And that's usually represented over a 30 year period. And lastly, projections, uh, which is a simulated response of the climate system to a scenario of climate change. And often we hear this is the coldest winter I've experienced. How could we possibly be following a warming trend? Uh, and we find this particular diagram to be a really neat analogy of ways to communicate the difference between climate variability and climate change really nicely. So you can see we're looking at a person walking up a hill with a dog. Sometimes the dog is above the person, other times it's below, and it tends to zigzag along the path for the whole trip. But at the end of the day, they're both heading in the same direction and both tracking the same to the same target destination. So you can say the dog is representative of the climate variability and the person represents the climate trend. As now we'll just touch on some of how the data in my climate view has been generated. And starting with why do we use gridded data for the past? So the image of Australia is showing the number of years between 1870 and 2019 for which rain gauges report rainfall. You can see there are quite a few stations in the darker colours that have been that have got data available for 130 to 150 years. But there are also many that have data for a much shorter amount of years. And looking at the positioning of the dots, you can see there aren't weather stations located everywhere. And in some cases, there might be large gaps in between where they're found, particularly in the less populated areas around central Australia. There also might be inconsistent record lengths for those weather stations as well, um, in instances where they may have been moved or have missing data. They may have also been newly commissioned. Uh, and it's also important to note that they don't all record the same climate variables. So some may only cover rainfall and others might also you know, do temperature and wind, for example, as well. Uh, and as one of my climate scientist colleagues who work on this particular project was quoted saying, there is no such thing as bad data, just poor, poor uncertainty quantification. Um, which conveys that there's no perfect data set and whatever we do choose, you know, there, there tends to be compromises. Uh, and for us to be able to fill in the gaps, so what we do, so I'm hoping you can see my mouse there. So what we do is take data from your closest weather station and taking into account things like topography to come up with an observation for every grid, grid square. And so to do this, we use a statistical process called interpolation, which allows us to get data from weather stations, which may be positioned in different or unevenly spaced areas, similar to the image here, and allows us to fill in the gaps to provide an evenly spaced grid similar to this. And one of the effects of interpolation is that it can smooth out extremes. So for example, if your nearby weather station gets a really big downpour, but it completely misses your nearest weather station, we might assume you got less than the full downpour, but more than nothing. And in actual fact, you, you might have had all or nothing. So which is why we tend to say it can smooth out the extremes. And because of this, it doesn't tend to be a good data set for use for daily observations, but it is a lot more suitable for long-term averages and trends, uh, which is what we use in my climate view. Um, and the data available in my climate view uh, comes from the Bureau's Australian Gridded Climate Data Set, the AGCD, 
and that allows us to get the relevant data all across Australia downscaled to a five kilometer grid. And we tend to use a similar process for downscaling the projection data as well. So to do this, we take downscaled observation data, like the image on the left there, and overlay that against the modeled projections. The global climate models are usually presented at quite a low resolution, usually around 150 to 200 kilometers, and that's on a global scale as well. And by overlaying this with the gridded observations, we get a clearer representation of the future climate. And this process is called change factor scaling. Uh, and we currently use CMIP5 data, which has been produced as part of the global initiative that stands for Coupled Model Intercomparison Project. And it's currently been in the process of updating to CMIP6 at the moment. And what that is, is a global initiative to standardize and verify global climate models in order to represent the diversity in the different models as well. We've chosen a subset of eight of these global climate models and average them together, um, which is what we call the multi-model mean. And that's how we represent the, the projections in my climate view. And because there's always gonna be a level of uncertainty in terms of how it will track with greenhouse gas emissions into the future, there are multiple emission scenarios, as you can see on the right there. In my climate view, we use two. So representative concentration pathway, which is what RCP stands for, we use 4.5. And that's the medium emission scenario and represents a heavy reduction in greenhouse gas emissions into the future. Uh, and we also use RCP 8.5, which we tend to say is kind of a, a business as usual and represents no action against reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we tend to frame them as the best case and worst case scenarios as climate scientists are saying, we're tracking between the two at the moment. And another reason we selected these two is because they were what we call application ready, which enabled us to readily utilize that for my climate view development. Uh, so looking from in the user's shoes in terms of selecting one over the other, so it really depends on how risk averse you are and how likely you are to adapt or manage the risks into the future. So we can delve into some examples of that um, in the demo. So now touching on what is climate services for agriculture and my climate view. The climate services for agriculture or we CSA, um, it's been federally funded through the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry's Future Drought Fund and has been developed in collaboration between CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology. So we currently have four products under the broader CSA umbrella um, and that's inclusive of an API for those interested in direct data access. And um, we've also developed a product called MapView Explorer, which presents similar data as my climate view but in more of a visual and regional context. We've got My Climate Advisor, which is a large language model to support technical adaptation question answering. Um, and then of course, My Climate View, which is our flagship product and what we're going to be focusing on in the most part for today. So the main things I wanted to highlight in this slide is that it is a free digital product and it's you know, really centralized around supporting farmers and land managers to understand what the future climate might look like and to prepare and adapt to future climate challenges. And my climate view has been designed to bring together 60 years of historic data, seasonal rainfall data, as well as future projections for three future time periods around 2030, 2050 and 2070. And that's all locally consistent to a five kilometer grid, as I mentioned, across all of Australia. And we've got tailored data for currently 22 specific commodities as well. And so without further ado, I might jump into a live demo. If anyone does want to follow along today, you can either um, do a Google search or an internet search of my climate view and you'll get taken to a link there, or you can just scan the QR code on the screen, which should take you directly there as well. So I'll just leave that there for a minute before I change over 
to the other screen. So you should get brought to this particular page here. And before I delve in, I'll just quickly flag some of the, the options in the top here. So we do still have a give feedback link in the top right that does get directly linked back to our team. So if you do have any feedback or any questions or, or any information to provide the team, feel free to use that channel. Otherwise, you're also more than welcome to contact us directly. In the help drop down, um, we've got the about my climate view. So that just gives you a, a snapshot of what commodities are available in the tool at the moment. So as I mentioned, we've got 22 commodities there at the moment. And it gives you a bit more of a background on the program and, and how it's progressed over the years. And more importantly, we've also got the frequently asked questions section here as well. So this has really been driven from questions that we tend to get out in the field or questions that we've asked ourselves to really help to support the use of, of this tool. So that just delves into a bit more detail about the commodities, about the historic data, the projection data, just to give you some more clarifications about some of the more technical components of the tool. And I've found it really helpful, so I encourage you to have a look at those. Um, in terms of resources, I mentioned that we do have access to an API as well. For anyone interested in that, um, the data access page just gives you a bit of information on how to, to get that. And we've also got some direct links in the data sources page here as well, just a link back to the direct sources of where we get the the data from. So I'll jump in. So I'm going to have a look at Griffith for the sake of today's demo. Um, but as I mentioned, so all the data is downscaled to a five kilometre grid. So I picture that across all of Australia in, in this map here. You can either search by suburb, you can search by longitude, latitude, you can search by postcode, um, and you can also actually pin on the map, the area of interest as well. So if it does fall to quite a remote region or if you've got quite a large property that you're looking at, you can actually go down to that paddock scale almost there. So I'll leave it just with Griffith there. And you also might notice, depending on where you do search, you might get a different commodity list as well. So what we've done is we've identified where the key growing regions are for each of the commodities we've represented. So you're not getting you know, crazy results like mangoes in the ACT or, <laughs> or examples like that. So you just get you know, ideally what is likely growing in those regions. So I'll leave it on none. And what we mean by none is just the general information. So I'll explain what that is once you get more information. And I might just zoom in a little bit just to make it a little bit easier to see. And so this is the next page that you'll get brought to. So this is the detail page. Well, this is the this summary page, sorry, I should say. And that just gives you a quick snapshot of what data sets we've got available for those different selections. So in terms of rainfall, we've got monthly rainfall and monthly data is actually a relatively new addition um, to the tool. Uh, we've got annual rainfall and rainfall broken down across the four key seasons. For temperature, again, we've got monthly data now available as well as the average maximum temperature, minimum temperature, the annual hot days and annual cold days. And we've also got seasonal evapotranspiration data available there as well. So ideally what this page enables you to do is have a look at the most recent 30 year average, which is from 1994 to 2023 against the 2050s average. And it gives you a bit of a snapshot as to how that has changed from those two different time periods. So you've got the ability to download that as a PDF if you're wanting to take that you know, out into the field or start a discussion with, with any of your networks around any of the, the topics here. So it's just an added feature there to make that a bit easier to facilitate. And what I might do is we'll jump into an example and I might jump into summer info. So once we go into more detail, this is what you call the detail page. 
So you can see looking at summer rainfall here, it gives you a bit of a definition as to what we mean by summer rainfall in terms of the date range and a little snapshot of, of why it's relevant as well. So I'll, we'll have a look at past only first and then we can delve into the past and future. So if we hover over each of these lines here, that's representative of each of the years, the historic years, and it gives you the average and what that looks like there. So 175 mil for 1968. The highlighted range, so is the 10th and the 90th percentile range across the data as well. And of course the average represented in the middle there. So you can really see how that's trended from you know, the historic 30 year period to the most recent 30 year period. And, and what you know, this particular narrative is, is telling me that there's been quite a bit of variability for this particular region in terms of summer, summer rainfall. And what we are then able to have a look at is what that means, you know, juxtaposed with the, the future projections as well. You can see we've got each of the five timeframes represented up the top here. And as I mentioned, we've got two of the different emission scenarios as well. So you've got the option of changing between the two up the top there. And so you can see the average has been pretty steady with you know, potentially slight increases into the future. But what's interesting from this is you can see the range in the projections is increasing as well. And we tend to say that that you know, can mean one of two things. It could either mean that the, the eight global climate models that we're using are disagreeing with each other. There's quite a bit of variability across the different models. Or it could also mean that there's you know, potentially going to be an increase in the actual variability within the data there as well. So it's just interesting to keep that dynamic in mind in terms of what that means. And you've also got the, it's probably not as relevant for summer rainfall, but I might just quickly jump into monthly rainfall just to quickly show this one as well. And so this just gives you the option to really tease down the data in terms of you know, around where the key changes are across each of the months across the 12 month calendar. And you can select specific months that are of interest as well and, and break that down a little bit further. So I just wanted to mention that as well and you get you know, a quick snapshot of, of what's happening across the whole picture there as well. Now I might jump into an actual commodity now just to show you the difference. We might do almonds to start with just to show a horticultural. And you'll notice, so we've still got all the general climate factors here. We've also got commodity factors that are relevant for almonds. So we've got wet days at harvest, warm days during pollination, frost at flowering and chill accumulation. So what we've done for each of the commodities is identified the, I suppose, the vulnerable stages across the production system where they are most exposed to, to climate change risks. And so if we have a look at frost at flowering, for example, So again, you can see how that has trended in the past against how that's potentially trending into the future. So I mentioned, you know, depending how risk averse you are. So if you're more risk averse, you might, you know, potentially choose the, the 8.5 versus 4.5. You know, if you want to prepare for the best case or worst case scenarios kind of thing. So it just gives you an idea of, yeah, how the climate has trended into the, the past to really help to inform what adaptation pathways you know, might be more suited to, you know, to make in the near or, or further futures. And what I'll also mention as well, so we had a look at rainfall, but it's also really important to have a look at a combination of different factors. So if you look at average maximum temperature, for example, So you could see before the rainfall was quite variable, but it was fairly steady for this particular region. But now when you're looking at maximum temperatures, the maximum temperatures is for the calendar year. You can see that's exponentially increasing 
and to the medium emission scenario into the future as well. So it just, you know, might, if you look at the kind of whole business impact perspective, although rainfall is steady, increasing temperature might, you know, mean increased irrigation demand or a number of kind of subsequent factors that you need to consider as well. So it's really important to look at, you know, each of the, the factors separately, but also in combination to see where the, you know, the real kind of narrative in what's happening is. Um, and what I will also just quickly show you as well before I jump back to the slides. I mentioned we've also got the seasonal rainfall data as well. And at the moment we do only show rainfall data, um, but that covers the next three months out as well as the next month out. So you've got the option of selecting between the two there. And this is using the, the Bureau's long range forecast data as well. So it just gives, it's kind of presented in a different way and breaks it down. So it just gives you an idea of 75% you know, chance of receiving 69 mil, 50% chance of 95 mil, 25% chance of 123 mil. And what's really interesting on this page is it gives you this star rating here. So hovering over that, that gives you an idea of how accurate the forecasts have been in previous years for this time of year, for this location. So it just gives you a, you know, a sense of how much, uh, I suppose, trust you can have in the, the data and how much you can really vouch on that for, for decisions. And you can see for this particular location from for August to October, it's got very high past accuracy. So 77% chances is quite good. Um, what I'll also show is we've got the median rainfall. So from August to October for the 1981 to 2018 period. So it just gives you a sense of how it's trending against the historic there. It's got the amount that we received last year in the same time frame, so 41 mil there. And it also gives you the amount of rainfall received in the previous three months. So from April to June, we received 147 mil. So it just helps to paint a bit of a picture of where we're sitting at the moment. And I find it quite complimentary for the, to contextualize the, the projection data there as well. So now I did go through <laughs> quite a bit of information there. So I'm hoping everyone's following along and I'll just jump back to my slides now. And I did just want to quickly introduce Matt View as well. Um, as I mentioned, I think this product in particular would be you know, of quite high value to many of you. And it is still an early prototype and not publicly available at this stage. Um, but the reason I really wanted to show it to you is that if there is enough feedback to support it, it can really help to guide what happens next with this tool. It does present the same data that's available in my climate view, but just in a more visual way. So each of the small squares, I don't know if that's granular enough to be able to see that, but each of the small squares represents the five kilometre grids. And it shows that across that whole region rather than just that one grid square. Um, and you can also define the regions as well. So some examples include you know, LGAs, state boundaries. Um, and I think what would be of most interest is we've also got the NRM regions available there as well. So just for consistency, we're looking at the Griffith, um, the region surrounding Griffith there as well. So you can select a range of different climate factors or timeframes, including historical projected data sets um, and compare multiple regions against each other as well, um, which helps to visualize how regions are changing and what opportunities you know, are likely to, to arise as well. Um, and there's quite a few other features as well, but just in the interest of time, more than happy to follow up with, with anyone if you're interested in this product in particular. Um, and I might have been missing a slide, but that's okay. Um, just before I finish up the questions, um, I did just want to quickly take the opportunity to mention that we are currently rolling out a workshop series, which we've dubbed the Train the Trainer program. Um, it's been designed along with the support of climate scientists, start skill and build confidence in advisors and extension officers when they're using My Climate View or 
communicating complex climate science with their respective networks as well. So it does go into a lot more detail than what we covered off on today, particularly around understanding weather and climate data. And it also gives you an opportunity to do a bit more of a deep dive into the tool in a group setting and see how you can apply the information you know, for things like bus farm business planning, um, ecology assessments, or really for any specific projects that, that you'll be involved with. So if anyone is interested in taking part or finding out more information on any of the products or activities we're working on, please get in touch. And otherwise, I might leave it there and I'll leave that slide on. We've got my email address up in the top right there. So feel free to, to get in touch, but I will leave it there. Thanks, Richard. Happy to take some questions. Thanks for that, Ashley. Um, the, I might open up. Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, there's small enough group here that we could probably do hands up, but otherwise, if you could put them in the chat, we'll have a look at it. Um, I noticed we do have one comment um, saying that, yeah, these uh, more keen to see more in these workshops. Um, that might be something, I don't know what the audience thinks, but uh, there might be an option to do an NRM specific one um, around the data and data sets that we could potentially organize as a follow up to this. And um, just looking at how we might use the data for some of the ecological and environmental stuff as well as ag. I don't know if there's an appetite for that, but it's something I'm happy to follow up with you, Ashley. Um, yeah, and that's something that we're very interested in, in doing. So yeah, happy to keep in touch. Um, I did have one question in the absence of others around MapView. You said it's currently not available to the public. Um, how do NRM regions or others get access to it if we are interested? Um, probably through us directly. So as I said, I'm happy to, to delve into a bit more detail and show the full functionality of that. But it is still quite an early prototype at the moment. So based on kind of the feedback that we get, it will help to kind of inform you know, what future direction we take in the product at the moment. It's kind of in a bit of limbo um, until we get some clear direction as to, to where it will go. Um, but yeah, more than happy to, to go into more detail with anyone that's interested in that. No, oh, thanks. Thanks, Ashley. Um, just, just a quick question. Um, actually, maybe it's not that quick, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, so for the southwest of Australia, all the, all the modelling, all the predictions, unfortunately, uh, in strong agreements, and that was in the IPCC report that we are in a strong drying trend, and that's been occurring since the nineteen seventies. We don't um, get the same extreme and frequent weather events that you get on the east coast. We just have a drying trend. So I was just wondering with the RCP is based on um, carbon emissions, global carbon emissions. The impact of that is different in different regions. Is that accounted for? Uh, yeah, I would say so. So in the global climate projections, so it includes a number of different data sets to get the kind of tailorability. But in terms of you know the accuracy of those projections across different regions, it is heavily variable. As you said, you know there's pretty high confidence in terms of temperature data across all of Australia, but rainfall tends to be a li little bit more isolated across particular regions and there is you know higher confidence in southwest wa around that drying trend whereas that's you know lower confidence across the east coast so it it definitely does take that into account and you know is consistent across the projections that we show in my climate view as well you know the warming trend is pretty consistent across all regions as i said but yeah rainfall tends to be a little bit more varied and there is a lot less confidence in, in the projections, as you can see, with the, the broader yeah. ranges. Oh, it'll be a great tool. We, we'll use it a lot, I think. Mm, great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Any other questions out there? No takers? I do have one follow-up question regarding the selection of the commodities. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the input to decide what commodities you focused on, is there still options to have others added there? If there's something missing or developing agricultural things in different parts of Australia? It's a great question. So the initial kind of remit around the decisions we've made for the commodities we've currently presented is we've kind of going through the highest value commodity options produced in Australia. And we kind of worked through the list there, but we're trying to get kind of the broader representation across a range of commodities. In terms of future development of commodities, I don't know that I can 
promise that we will do any more development in commodities at this particular stage. Um, but it is something you know that we we will definitely consider moving forward. And is that it's based on current growing areas or future as well, given the, the potential climate changes? Um, that's if I can yeah, sorry, just jump in quickly, Ashley. Um, we are looking at some other options as opposed to actually adding commodities, adding more flexibility. So you can, um, for example, choose a, a different commodity and then edit it to suit the crop that you're actually growing um or possibly even a, a build your own kind of um commodity option um but what we're looking at now is whether we're going to focus continue to focus on the farmer and advisor user group that we're looking at at the moment or or go into a more um policy and regional planning kind of user group um so my climate view is very much designed for farmers and advisors with that with that input um and so in terms of our adoption strategy that's who we're focusing on as it is um but in terms of the future development of the program there's a, a couple of options that we could be going could follow um follow through on but i think nrm's actually kind of straddle both of those uh, because there's a, that input into policy and policy development and also that direct contact with farmers. So we really would like to talk to you a bit more about where you see the value for this product and for the My Climate View and CSA sort of suite of products as well. It's just what I said, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if that answered your question though. <laughs> it did, it did. Um, I, I, Cause I, I suppose I'm aware that uh, certainly in Tassie, the state government did our wealth from water initiative where they try to map soil types and other variables to give an idea of areas suitable for growing crops and this obviously comes in with another overlay on top of that or updated updated information potentially that would add value to you know existing products so yeah I just uh, I'm sure there's other equivalents around Australia that might benefit from some of this input as well so if we can make the links through regional NRM that would be a good thing too. Yeah that'd be great thank you. Um, I've got a question up now. Um, how can people get in touch with you regarding future directions to support policy? Um, feel free to get in contact with us and we can start having conversations around that because that is a relatively new you know, field for, for us. So I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen. Um, I've added yeah. your email to the to the channel chat channel, Ashley, Perfect. but I wasn't sure if Stephanie, if you're, if you're in a yeah. different sort of area in terms of looking at future directions of software for the Bureau of Meteorology. Yeah, sure. Um, you're welcome to get in touch with me. You can also, via email, um, I'll also give you my number, but we also have a feedback for, form on my Climate View website and that comes to that comes to me as well. So, um, but if you do use that channel, please do put your a return email address on it because Sometimes we get questions through there with no return email. Um, so yeah, with any any of those channels, you can get in touch with all of our team. Thanks. Thanks. I had one more question. I'm aware that certainly you, Stephanie and Ashley, have been out and about in around Australia doing a sort of roadshow. Um, is that roadshow um, coming to an end or is it ongoing? Because obviously if we've got regions here who are interested in finding out a bit more or directing other stakeholders to come along, um, do you have a schedule of events and things that we can tap into? Yeah, um, from, oh, sorry, go on, Ash. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, we're, we're traveling around from now until December. We're still developing, uh, still presenting the training programs that we run with the My Climate View tool. Um, we can also do webinars like this or any other online things, even if you have like a farmer group who are interested to to hear about it. Um, but definitely we'll be uh, able to travel for um, the higher level kind of training for um, between now and December. Excellent. 
Um, and again, I'm assuming we contact you directly or you can contact us through the NRM Regions Australia and we're happy to pass that on if there are yeah. people interested out there. And Susanna has a hand up. Yeah, thanks, Trish. Um, that was really interesting to see that presented. It looks really useful. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to just clarify, and I might have missed this because um, I was busy exploring the tool myself when you were presenting, Ash, but the seasonal outlook page. So is that taking into account, um, I guess, the details of the current um, situation, such as La Nina and all that, um, rather than just being a sort of general seasonal outlook for how that season might look? Um, trending over years to come, and that's actually specific to this year? Yep, yep, that's yeah. specific to the next month or next three months, yeah, so that's straight from the Bureau, that data there. Yeah, cool, okay, thank you. All good. Any more questions? I'm not seeing any hands at this point. Um, I would point out that um, if you do have questions after this event, as I say, as well as contacting our fabulous colleagues at the Bureau directly, and um, you can actually contact them through our Slack channel, run through NRM Regions Australia. Um, oh, I've got a question, Victoria. Oh, you're on mute. Okay. Um, Victoria's just coming over here, so <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it wouldn't unmute for some reason. Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, I just put a question up in the chat before. I'm just wanting clarification um, where the data has been coming from, whether it's only the bomb weather stations or whether there's other stakeholders um, information coming in through. Yep, good question. Um, so we do use only the Bureau station data because we know that it has been verified and you know, it has consistent record lengths from you know, all of the historic data or historic kind of periods as well as the, um, yeah, across all of the data sets. So that's particularly the reason why we've chosen to just use the Bureau station data opposed to other um, you know, industry owned or privately owned stations as well. Um, and I guess on that, um... Is that an opportunity to explore that further? Because I know in our region, you know, there is such a difference in the climate, which we're not really capturing and whether, you know, you've got like deep herd in Western Australia, you know, whether, and there's weather stations out there, there's more that can help support and add additional data. Uh, we have explored that in the past. I'm happy to take any kind of feedback that you've got if you're you know, happy to send me an email with a bit more data, a detail. But, um, yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one just in terms of getting the consistency across all of Australia. Um, yeah, I don't know that I've got a good answer for that one, unfortunately. I don't know, Steph, if you've got anything to add. Yeah, the Bureau has a few, has, has looked at that, but at the moment Bureau, option, Bureau product tip for the seasonal water outlook, national water outlook, I think uses just Bureau weather station data. Um, and my climate view basically just fits in with that as well. So we at the moment just use um, Bureau weather station data for the Australian gridded climate data set. But one thing to note when you're looking at it is the, it is an average data set over 30 years. So if you do look at if you were to get the download daily data from the gridded data set and compare it to the farm gauge, it would look completely different. But if you look at it averaged over decades, it, it matches much, much better. So for a product like my climate view, just um, we don't want to give the impression that it, there's that much confidence in it, that these minor, minor differences will, um, will come out. Um, so in an, as a, a product that shows 30 year averages, it, we expect that you wouldn't notice too much difference. Um, but if you looked at it side by side with a farm gauge, definitely you would notice that it, the difference there or in a short term forecast, for example. So, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we get any additional questions out there? If not, I won't hold anyone up. Oh, 
you still get your hand up, Victoria. I take it that's a legacy issue. Yeah. No. Well, if there's no further questions, I'm happy to, to wind up today's proceedings. Um, just a reminder, we'll send out an email with appropriate links. The Slack channel will be open for any communications, thoughts, ideas. And as I say, our fabulous uh, presenters today have uh, passed on contact details directly. So um, if we get any questions for them, we can certainly, uh, there's no shortage of means to get in touch. Um, and as regional inner and regions Australia, we'll certainly be following up on some of the ideas about some of the train the trainer stuff and how it might be applied um, through NRM. So I'm happy to do that. And uh, finally, there is a feedback survey and um, there's a link in the chat and there'll be a link in the follow up email. Uh, I would really encourage you to, to fill it in if these events are useful. Um, if you've got other ideas or you've got follow-ups on what we've discussed today, please let us know and we will do our absolute best to make sure we get the right people in the room for another in the tent within our end. On that note, I might conclude today's proceedings and just say thank you again to our fabulous presenters, Ashley, Stephanie and Andrew managed to get away without saying anything, so good on you, Andrew. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Richard. <laughs>